Hello, and welcome to our video on energy. I'm trying something new for our homework here. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked how useful our homework was, and you guys reported that it was pretty useful, um, but uh, there was definitely some room for improvement, so I'm trying something new, uh, trying to make things better, as always. So uh, I'll see if I can make more videos like this, and you guys let me know if they are helpful. So today's video is on energy and matter. As you can see here on the slide, matter cycles while energy flows. Um, that's the big concept that we're going to be talking about. Uh, coming up this week, you guys are going to be creating a model of energy flow uh, in an ecosystem and use it to explain why ecosystems have so few predators. So let's go ahead and get started. If you're watching this on Monday or Tuesday, which hopefully you are, then in class we will have just finished up our lesson on the cycling of matter. Um, so the important things to, uh, to remember in the cycle of matter is that matter is never destroyed. Matter always stays in an ecosystem and cycles through various molecules. We focused on carbon dioxide in the carbon cycle, which you can see here. Uh, is illustrated. Carbon dioxide goes through photosynthesis to become glucose, goes through cellular respiration to become CO2 again, and it cycles around and around. So if we focus here, this is carbon dioxide. This is a model of carbon dioxide. Each uh, ball here is an atom. So carbon dioxide is made up of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Together, though, all three of these atoms make up one carbon dioxide molecule. So each atom is matter, and you need to remember that the matter is never destroyed. It just cycles. In the carbon cycle, the carbon from carbon dioxide gets absorbed by plants during photosynthesis and converted into a different molecule called glucose. See, the black carbon atoms right here are the same black carbon atoms over here. This is the process of photosynthesis and it's making a glucose molecule, but the atoms are still there. The opposite of this is cellular respiration in which glucose goes through cellular respiration to become carbon dioxide. So it cycles around and around. So that's the matter that is cycling. However, in this lesson, we're gonna be focusing more on energy. Now, energy is anything that can do work. That's how it's defined. The energy powers all of life. So if you look at this molecule of glucose right here, you can see all of these atoms, each little dot is an atom, and the whole thing is a molecule. That's the matter that we're talking about so far. So where does the energy come in? Well, the energy is in these molecular bonds, these lines that are holding each ball together, those are molecular bonds. Those bonds store energy. They store potential energy. So inside this glucose, there are all these bonds, and they're all storing this energy. And when you break those bonds, like you can see right down here, when you break these bonds in a molecule, you release that energy. That energy right there that comes out when you break the bonds, that is released as heat and as the energy needed to power life. Um, it changes the molecule. You no longer have a large glucose molecule. You might have smaller molecules, uh, but the atoms stay the same. That energy that comes out, it is released as heat, as I said, and movement of molecules. It is the energy of life. Um, however, unlike the arc reactor, you need new molecules to get more energy. Each time you break a molecule, you use up that molecule's energy, and you must get new molecules for more energy. Humans, we do that by eating. We eat to get molecules for energy, and we also eat to get some molecules, some matter, to build up our bodies. So let's focus in a bit more on energy. Really focus on energy. This molecule right here, is called trinitrotoluene, or TNT. In trinitrotoluene, it has three nitrogen atoms, these blue dots right there, there, and there. Those atoms of nitrogen 
have these nitrogen bonds right here, here, and here. And those bonds are really, really strong. When you break those bonds in TNT, you make a very big reaction, which you can see in this video right here. Yeah. So that is uh, breaking uh, a molecule of trinitrotoluene, or lots of molecules of TNT. And you can see that the energy from that reaction is released as heat, it's released as light, it's released as sound, and it's released as the movement of the molecules. So that energy that's coming out is coming from the breaking of bonds. In life, we don't want to have a huge explosion like this. We want uh, to be much more controlled when we're breaking bonds. We have a much more controlled reaction of breaking this glucose molecule. We break that down. But at the same time, you still make lots of heat. That's why our bodies are warm. That's where we get our energy for living. So, it's important to remember, matter cycles through an ecosystem, and energy flows through an ecosystem. Because the matter is not destroyed, it keeps cycling, the energy must be replaced. Each time you break a molecule, you must replace it with a new molecule. Some of the energy from that molecule is lost, is gone as heat. Other parts of the energy is used to make your body and move your body and all that kind of stuff. So energy flows through an ecosystem. It has a starting place and it has an ending place. So where? Where does energy start and where does it end? Well, for the vast, vast, vast majority of all life on Earth, that energy originally comes from the sun. It comes from light energy from the sun. Now, plants are amazing creatures. They have this ability, they have this, um, this chloroplast, this structure inside their leaves that allows light to hit these molecules and it actually changes, uh, it, they can capture that energy and change molecules uh, into glucose. They actually take carbon dioxide, they take six of these, as well as some water, as you can see way down there. And they use the energy to store that energy inside all of these tiny little bonds in the glucose molecule. So carbon dioxide does not have very much useful energy that you can get by breaking the bonds of carbon dioxide. But if you put energy into carbon dioxide, you can build up a molecule of glucose instead and the bonds in glucose store a lot more energy. All that energy is the energy that plants use to grow. Plants make sugar, glucose, and they use that sugar for themselves. They make it for themselves. Plants use it to grow, to build their bodies, and of course, some is lost as heat. So you can see that here. A plant uh, makes sugar. If this bar down here represents all of the energy that is being stored or captured by a plant, um, you can see what is that energy used for. Some of it is used for heat. Some of it is used for living actions like growing and pumping water up from their roots and making apples and that sort of thing. And the other part uh, of that energy is used to actually build up their body. They use that sugar to grow, to get bigger. It's the physical matter. However, if a plant gets eaten by, say, a cow, this little guy right here, this cow, this herbivore, can't get the energy that's been lost as heat. It can't get the energy that's been already used by the plants for all of its living actions. It can only get the molecules that are in the bodies of the plant. So they have much less energy. This cow has much less energy available to it than the plant did. And the cow, the herbivore, also uses some of that energy released as heat. Some of that energy is used to uh, power their life so they can moo and walk around and sleep. And some of their energy is used to actually make the body 
of the cow itself. So even though the, they might eat a lot more plants, their bodies are going to be smaller than their sum total of how much they've eaten. And then if some other organism comes around and eats the cow, like this tiger, the tiger also, this carnivore, also has that same effect. Some, they can only eat the body of the cow. They can't eat the energy that's used for life, and they can't eat the energy that's been lost as heat. So they can only use this portion from here to here. They can only use that range for their cell, for themselves. So some of that energy themselves lost as heat. Some of that energy is used for their own life actions to run around and climb and have babies. And only a tiny portion is used up for their body. So you can see that a plant has a lot of energy, and then the herbivores have much less, and carnivores even less than that. The majority of that energy is being lost as heat, um, being lost to provide the actions of the molecules, and only a tiny portion is left over to fill in the bodies. What ecologists call this is the 10% rule, or the rule of 10%. And it says that even though there might be a lot of sunlight, the plants are only going to get some of that sunlight and actually make it into their bodies. And then the primary consumers, the ones that eat plants, are only going to get 10% of that energy from the plants. The uh, secondary consumers would only get 1% of the energy of the plants. And anything that eats a secondary consumer would get 0.1% of the energy of the plants originally. Now imagine if you also in this ecosystem of flowers and grasshoppers and mice and rats, you also had an eagle. Well, that eagle would only be able to get 0.01% of the original plants. They lose 90% of the energy. It is released as heat. It is released as uh, movement of the molecules inside their bodies and only a tiny portion is left over to actually be consumed by the next trophic level. So in class this week you guys are going to be working on building a food web and uh, you're going to use that food web to explain why the whole world is not covered in tigers. Why are there so few predators in the world? So, that's all for now. I'd like to leave you today with a song that I've been enjoying listening to. Um, if you enjoy it, feel free to click this link right here and listen to it in its entirety. Um, and as always, be ready to ask some wonderful questions.